I'm uh, Richard Wortman from the Columbia Department of History. And I'll just make one brief remark about Kathy. Uh, I taught a course with her. And everyone here probably knows what that means. Uh, uh, I, was, I was very reluctant. <laughs> and I can't say I didn't suffer. Uh, but uh, it was an enormous learning experience. Uh, I wasn't going to uh, teach the course. And I learned so much from that course. Uh, and got to know Kathy, which was wonderful. Uh, and it went, uh, it confirmed Bob Belknap's uh, famous remark that Columbia is the one institution that educates the faculty. <laughs> okay, our first speaker is uh, my student, uh, uh, Mila Trigos, who will speak on uh, myths and monuments, the Decemberists in the Soviet and post Soviet landscape. Just a quick remark about Kathy. Uh, Kathy was my master's and my dissertation advisor, along with Irina and Richard. Um, and so um, you can, <laughs> you will, you will see from this presentation how her reading of a variety of texts um, from both high and low culture uh, influenced the way that I approach material. The passage of nearly two centuries has not dimmed the Decemberist uprising as a vibrant event in Russian historical consciousness. Recurring anniversary celebrations and frequent literary, cinematic, operatic, and even comic book. Oops, what did I just do? Hold on. Ah, here we go. Even comic book depictions of the uprising attest to the Decemberist hold on the Russian cultural imagination. The fascination with the Decembers began immediately after the revolt on December 14, 1825, and continues to the present day. Despite the revolt's failure to achieve its immediate goals, it has had an enormous political and cultural impact. I've written elsewhere about the evolution and multivalence of the Decemberist myth in Russian literature and culture. Today, I'll be focusing on the topographical myth of the Decemberists, that is, how they were memorialized and became embedded in the Russian Soviet and post-Soviet landscape. After quashing the Decemberist revolt, Nicholas I orchestrated rituals of state and power to emphasize his victory, first by presenting his son and heir, Alexander, to the troops for their acclamation, second by conducting a church service on Senate Square to cleanse it of the symbolic stain of the Decemberist treason against the state. This symbolic reclamation of imperial space furthered Nicholas's claim to legitimacy, which rested not just on his ability to lead the empire to triumph through a moment of rebellion, but also on the promise of future stability in establishing a lineage by producing an heir to the throne. After the uprising, the government controlled the release of information about the revolt, the sentencing, and execution. A ban was placed on representations of the Decemberists in any medium, unless Nicholas or members of the imperial court commissioned them. And this would be one example of that. The Decemberist names and images would be erased from historical memory, but Nicholas's victory on December 14th was commemorated at the court every year with a solemn church service, was depicted in several paintings from the mid-1830s to the 1860s, and was treated in the authorized history of Nicholas's ascension to the throne by Baron Modeste Corp from 1848, a text which was commissioned by his son, Alexander, and corrected by Nicholas himself. Concerted efforts were made by the officials to ensure that the graves of the five executed Decemberists, Ryleyev, Pestel, Kachovsky, Muravyov, Apostol, and Bestush of Ryumin, would not become a site of pilgrimage or commemoration. After their hanging, their bodies were removed and buried in an unknown spot on Gulladai Island, a remote location in Petersburg. Despite numerous petitions by the families and friends of the executed Decemberists, the imperial authorities did not disclose any information about their location or allow reburial. Ryleyev's wife and Alexander Pushkin, among others, attempted to locate the gravesite, but it remained undiscovered throughout the 19th century. The search continued into the 20th century when, after the 1917 revolution, a commission was set up to find the graves of the executed Decemberists to erect a monument to them. However, in Siberia, further away from the locus of imperial power, the graves of the Decemberists and their families were marked and memorialized early on. And you'll see here um, a mausoleum that was erected uh, with the death of the Decemberists, Nikita Muravyov's wife, Alexandra, um, and uh, her daughter and another Decemberists child, Ivan von Wiesen, were buried there, as well as in the small crypt um, uh, grave for the Decemberists, Aninkov, and his wife's daughter, um, Anna. 
several of these lieux de mémoire were represented in paintings in the mid-19th century, um, which were not circulated, uh, but were kept as family um, relics and heirlooms, and in commemorative postcards in 1905. As Alison Rowley notes, picture postcards are, and I'm quoting here, tantalizing objects central to understanding the social history and visual culture of fin de siècle Russia. Produced in numbers dwarfing the print runs of posters or popular prints and available in every corner of the empire, picture postcards had the power not only to reflect popular culture, but also to shape it. Through picture postcards, it is possible to discern the multiplicity of the often contradictory beliefs and values swirling through popular culture at the time. That's the end of the quote. This card uh, down at the bottom picturing the church and graves of the Decembrists in Petrovsky Zavod in Siberia is from a firm called D.P. Yefimov, and it may have been part of a larger group of postcards issued in 1905, which also had portraits of the Decembrists. Images of these personages, formally forbidden from any kind of representation, could now cross the vast empire and could further strengthen the association of certain geographical areas with the Decembrists. Rowley's work on postcards of revolutionaries produced after 1905 illustrates how popular culture became politicized after 1905 and how revolutionaries, and I'm quoting here in turn, also became articles of popular consumption. In addition to the change in celebrity status of the Decembrists, their political currency rose sharply when Vladimir Lenin designated them as the founding fathers of revolutionary activism and the forefathers of the Bolsheviks in his 1913 article, Pamiti Gertsina. After the success of the October Revolution in 1917, the Bolsheviks loudly proclaimed their revolutionary lineage to bolster their government's legitimacy. In an attempt to make their claim even more concrete, they strove to assert their victory with new monuments and mind Russian history for its usable past. Past. Lenin's plan of monumental propaganda reflected the new state's myth of revolutionary prehistory and genealogy, substituting new monuments for the old statues to past rulers, and sometimes breaking up those very statues and using parts uh, from the old monuments, combining them with their new monuments. Influenced by Tommaso Campanella's utopia of the ideal city-state, City of the Sun, which turned religion into science and the urban landscape into a museum and outdoor school, that's Richard Stite's words, Lenin Lenin wanted cities decorated with plaques and blocks of stone inscribed with Marxist axioms as well as with statues and busts of important figures in the history of socialism, revolution, and culture. The December Studio of Pestel were included among the names of honored radical activists, regicides, and peasant rebels from both Europe and Russia to be on display. Stites calls this the Bolsheviks' first public lesson and a, quote, display of history by monuments, unquote. At this juncture, the Decembrist myth evolved from being a myth of opposition against the autocracy to become an official legitimating myth of the Soviet state. The Bolsheviks reinforced their claim against the writings of the Russian emigre nobility, many of whom were directly related to the Decembrists and sought to make themselves the keepers of the Decembrist legacy. The official establishment of the Decembrists within Leningrad's topography began as early as 1918, when Afitserskaya Ulitsa was renamed Ulitsa Dikabristov. But with the, the December centennial celebration, the December's prominent role became firmly embedded in the Soviet landscape right in the center. Senate Square was renamed December Square in 1925 in honor of the December centennial. Another monument commemorating the centennial of the execution of the Decembrists in 1926 marked the supposed gravesite of the Decembrists on Ostrov Galadai. In addition, the island itself was also renamed Ostrov Dikabristov. During the solemn festival marking the occasion, one speaker insisted, quote, the best monument to the Decembrists is the USSR, mm -hmm. magnifying the December significance to its largest possible physical manifestation. The Decembrists also became the point of origin for the history of political imprisonment in Russia and expanded beyond its original symbolism as a failed revolution and example of self-sacrifice to further a lofty cause. And you'll see here, I have just various uh, photos, especially of places in, in Petersburg. The designation of places of memory uh, devoted to the Decembrists usually coincided with the celebration of a significant anniversary. To honor the sesquicentennial of the uprising, a monument was a monument was erected on the site of the execution of the five Decembrist leaders on the ramparts of Peter Paul Fortress. Streets in many other cities in the Soviet Union were officially renamed in honor of the Decembrists and their wives. I found at least um, seven different locations within Ulitsa de Kabristov, um, and in Chita as well, you have Damskaya Ulitsa, named for where the Decembrist wives had their homes. 
Over the course of the Soviet era, monuments to the Decembrists were constructed not only in Leningrad, but also in Kaminka in Ukraine and many towns in Siberia where the Decembrists spent time in prison and in exile. Yalutavorsk builds itself as the city of the Decembrists and offers tours to December sites as a unique regional experience. The monuments range from the more traditional to examples of socialist realist sculpture, such as the monument in Angarsk, and as you can see, that's the one on um, your right, uh, with the uh, Decembrists um, transformed into almost Stakhanovite figures, bare-chested and bursting out of a pillar of stone. <laughs> My personal favorite is this strange combination of imperial and Soviet iconography. Um, in this monument to the Decembrists and to Lenin, <laughs> where we see Soviet revolutionary genealogy literalized with a statue of Lenin resting upon the heads of the Decembrists. And on the bottom, you'll see this sort of traditional um, iconography, uh, especially of the two um, uh, profiles. It was very common for uh, the en engraving that was on the front of Herzen's Palyarnaya Zvizda, the, the profile of the five who were executed to be put on some sort of an obelisk or at the base of the monument um, devoted to Decembrists. And um, the, the plaques quote Herzen and Lenin for authority, the typical quotes that everybody has heard ad nauseum, so I won't re repeat them. Um, as Benjamin Forrest and Juliet Johnson suggest in their study of Soviet era monuments and post-Soviet national identity in Moscow, monuments are quote, powerful because they appear to be permanent markers of memory and history but that they require commemorative vigilance, to use a term by, uh, coined by Pierre Nora. Forrest and Johnson suggest that when normal politics have been interrupted by revolution or regime change, that existing monuments and other places of memory can experience one of three possible fates. They either become co-opted, slash glorified, disavowed, or contested. Lenin's plan of monumental propaganda ended up succeeding in relation to December's places of memory with monuments and memorial plaques marking the landscape of St. Petersburg especially. However, during the post-Soviet era, we see all three of these fates occurring with December's monuments, depending on their location, co-opting and glorification, especially in the provinces and in Siberia, and the process now of contesting or disavowing the monuments in the center. In St. Petersburg in 2008, the first step toward the establishment of a post-Soviet revision or reversion to imperial space took place, uh, with the reversion in naming from December Square back to Senate Square, though many other December streets and monuments remain and are still adorned with flowers. Although the majority of December's monuments were constructed in the heyday of the Soviet era from the 1960s through the 1970s, several new monuments have been constructed since 2000 using public funds and private donations, um, specifically monuments to the Decembrists in Yekaterinburg in 2000 and in Kurgan in two, uh, 2011 and uh, 2015, and to the Decembrists' wives, finally, in Tobolsk in 2008 and Irkutsk in 2011. These monuments all valorize the Decembrists as important figures in the history of political imprisonment and as contrib uh, contributors to and benefactors of local Siberian culture, providing medical assistance and establishing schools for the local population. What I find telling, however, is the most recent monument added to uh, the St. Petersburg landscape, memoria memorializing General Mikhail Miloradovich. 1812 war hero who was wounded on Senate Square during the Decembrist Revolt and died later that day, shot by um, uh, uh, Kakovsky. In a solemn ceremony conducted on December 4th, 2015, Miloradovich's monument was unveiled at approximately the same time as many other cities were commemorating the 190th anniversary of the Decembrist uprising. Miloradovich was recognized as a great patriot and savior of Russia. Um, this step appears to be another sign of the times and to indicate that there will be uh, contested narratives within Russian history or that the contesting of narratives will continue and that, the, um, and that there is going to be a disavowal potentially of the December's legacy as opponents um, of the autocracy and we will probably continue to see that menacing return to the autocratic past. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, our second uh, presentation will be Nicole Sobordny.
uh, Václav Nijinsky's feeling or how an immigrant dancer digested the Russian literary yes. classics. Okay. Thank you. Um, the formulation of my title is meant as a call out to Kathy. I'm thinking specifically of her article, The Telltale Black Baby or Why Pushkin Began the Blackamoor of Peter the Great but didn't finish it. I remember Kathy coming up with this title, how she wanted it to evoke the 18th century. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to see her modeling, you, can you hear this? Or, okay. To see her modeling the writing process on many occasions. Um, Kathy cared passionately about words. She was a brilliant writer and also a great writing mentor, giving invaluable comments, not just on the final written product, but on the psychology of the writing process. So thank you, Liza, Carly, and the department for organizing the symposium in her honor. So, uh, Nijinsky's feeling <laughs> with feeling in italics. This refers to Nijinsky's writing known in English translation as the Diary of Vaslav Nijinsky, but which Nijinsky himself indicates that he wants to title Chustvo and divide into two parts, Zizin and Smert. Throughout Chustvo, Nijinsky calls attention to the meta-literary process of his writing and declares his intention to publish his work. The writing ends abruptly, practically mid-sentence. Although Nijinsky doesn't provide dates, we know from his biography that the date here is March 4th, 1919. This was the day that his wife and in-laws took him to Zurich, where he would be diagnosed as, quote, a confused schizophrenic with mild manic excitement, unquote. At the time, 29 years old and the most famous dancer in the world, Nijinsky would spend the next three decades of his life in and out of psychiatric institutions. He never went back to his writing and never performed publicly again. Much of that time, Nijinsky would live in what has been described as a catatonic stupor, a captive in his own mind, as Igor Stravinsky would write years later, his most perfect gift of expression and movement, stricken, immobile. Oops. God. All right. Um, at the time of his writing, Nijinsky was living in semi-retirement with his wife and four-year-old daughter in Samarit, Switzerland. Cut off from the ballet world, from any real community of experimental artists, from his beloved mother and sister who were stranded in Bolshevik Russia, and it seems from any Russian speakers. A sense of displacement and hom homesickness pierces through his writing in his expressions of love for the Russian land, the Russian, Russian food, the Russian language, and Russian writers. Today I was planning on talking about Nijinsky's dialogue with Dostoevsky, and, and for that digestion is a key metaphor. But then I thought for a symposium honoring Kathy, a Pushkin intertext is more appropriate. You have Pushkin's poem, Nidai Minye Bog Saitsi Suma. Pushkin wrote this in 1833, the same year he wrote The Bronze Horseman. As you know, the subject of an excellent article by Kathy, and I would add my favorite of hers. It was in 1833 that Pushkin was particularly fascinated by, as Gary Rosenschild puts it, the genres of madness. I want to call your attention to the three-part structure of the poem. It begins with the poet's plea not to go out of his mind, lines one through three, and then the persona imagines two hypothetical states of madness, one positive, lines 4 through 18, and one negative, lines 19 to 30. In the first hypothetical situation, the persona valorizes madness from an inside perspective. Note the following words indicating mobility, rezva, pustilsia, vichra, expansion outdoors, les, nebesa, palya, vol, strength, silen, happiness, shastya, Sensory perception, zaslushivalsia, glidiel, artistic expression, piel, and visionary experience, plamenum bredu, chadu nistroinich, chudnich grez. In lines 17 and 18, the speaker becomes both a creative and destructive force. Perhaps because of the danger implied in those two lines, the poem then gives way to a completely opposite view of madness. In the third section, the poet imagines madness from an outside perspective. Instead of the agency of ya, the pronoun changes to tibia. Instead of images of freedom and mobility, the images here show immobility and imprisonment. A person, tibia, is locked up, zaprut, put on display, skvoz rishotku, seen as a little beast, zverka, a fool, duraka, to be teased, draznits. 
The forces of nature are contained. Madness becomes spectacle. The poem doesn't offer a synthesis or resolution, but rather juxtaposes these two representations of madness, leaving it up to the reader to decide whether to side more with the valorization of madness or its devalorization, or to accept the ambivalence of the two juxtaposed situations. We start with this poem in a course I teach at Washington University. The poem serves as a kind of blueprint for the treatment of madness in other works by Pushkin, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Chekhov, Gippius, Garshin, and others, including Nijinsky's diary. We ask the question, which of these such situations is emphasized in capacity and captivity or a liberating visionary experience? In Nijinsky's work, the juxtaposed images of madness presented in Pushkin's, play, Pushkin's poem play out in a unique way. As readers of feeling, we feel a tension between two narrative movements in counterpoint. In the foreground, Nijinsky is writing freely, automatically, about his bodily movement and feelings, <coughs> thereby taking us, his readers, on his mind-expanding flights of fancy, corresponding to the second section of Pushkin's poem. Meanwhile, Nijinsky records mundane events happening in the background, knocks on the door, the doorbell ringing, muffled phone conversations overheard, a telegram received, in which he is being taken to clinical diagnosis and institutionalization, corresponding to the third section of Pushkin's poem. <coughs> in other words, the two situations in Pushkin's poem, presented sequentially and hypothetically, are recorded in feeling, Chuspa, simultaneously and in real time. To be more specific, images, images from the second section of Pushkin's poem are played out through Nijinsky's <coughs> recording of his solitary walks in the mountains surrounding his house in St. Moritz. Like the disordered delirium Pushkin describes, Nijinsky's walks have a dreamlike symbolic quality, and it's hard for us to discern if they really took place, even though he assures us that I lived through all of this in practice, na praktikia. Like Pushkin's persona, Nijinsky seeks strength, happiness, and creativity in this mobile delirium, or what he calls a trance. In his second walk, for example, he tells us he went to a mountaintop and looked out. Ya pachustvoval golas i zakrichal pa francuski. Parol! Ya hetiel gavarit no moi golas will nastolka silen, što ya ni mog gavarit i zakrichal. As Pushkin's persona becomes one with elemental forces, Nijinsky tells us, For Nijinsky, life is energy, and he literally feels the movement of the natural elements with and in his entire body. The elemental force might seem pathological and dangerous, but he believes it is a psychic mobility that will save the Earth from ecological destruction. While Pushkin's persona cuts down forests, Nijinsky wants to preserve forests by saving paper. While Pushkin's persona digs up the fields, Nijinsky warns people about the dangers of digging for coal and pumping oil and petroleum out of the Earth. He proposes alternative sources of energy, a way to get physical power, paluchats fizichisku silu, without fossil fuels. Now let me give a few examples of how the images from the third section of Pushkin's poem find resonance in Chustvo. Nijinsky uses the pronoun ya repeatedly, and while Pushkin's poem changes pronouns only in the fourth stanza, Nijinsky changes perspective throughout, sometimes imagining how others perceive him, putting these hypothetical thoughts of others in quotation marks, as in, on su masa shol, on tansor, i bolshenichi He is aware that his very act of writing is seen as a sign of madness, frightening others and eliciting mockery. He knows that he's being observed and fears that vazmut minyaf sumashedshi dom, iya patiryayu su rabotu. The closer ca captivity looms, the more urgently he cries out, Ya yist chilovyek, a nizvier, and Ya glup, a nidurak. When his in laws arrive, he escapes. He walks and then runs through the snow, desperately seeking a room to rent where he can finish writing Chustvo. He ends up in Samaritzdorf at the telegraph office. He feels someone touch his shoulder and looks around. 
it's Dr. Frankel ready to take him back. Dr. Frankel was the sports medicine doctor that his wife had employed to psychoanalyze him. Um, I'll, wrap up by asking, <laughs> I'll wrap up by asking the question, to what extent did Nijinsky consciously engage in dialogue with Pushkin's poem? Unlike the other writers he engages with in Chustvo, Nijinsky mentions Pushkin only once. The reference occurs when he remembers how hard his life was when he had just graduated from the Imperial Ballet School. He used to love to retreat to his own room where he would study the works of Dostoevsky, Gogol, and Pushkin. He tells us. To that end, Nijinsky copied out Pushkin's poems over and over, thinking that he could learn how to write poetry and novels like Pushkin. But then he realized that this imitation was pointless and abandoned it. In feeling, Chustvo, Nijinsky certainly doesn't copy P Pushkin, but at this point of crisis in his life, at this point when he's immersed in a solitary study of the Russian language and obsessed by the very sound of the words um and razum, they occur on every single page, um, it seems natural that Pushkin's poem would have provided a type of structure and vocabulary for Nijinsky to express, as he calls it, Nuzhny Vyeshi. Our next speaker is Jonathan Platt, and he will speak on The Black Bard, Lend Film Biopics about Pushkin for the 1937 Jubilee. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to share a little bit from my book on the 1937 Pushkin Jubilee that's uh, supposed to be coming out next month. Uh, and it's uh, you know very sad that uh, Kathy's not going to be around to see it. Um, she was the um, uh, she was my advisor for the MA thesis, which was the uh, time when I first started working on this project. And uh, along with Irina, she was also the one who convinced me to develop it, which it entombed me in the project for 15 years. But I think it was it was good. Uh, I remember that actually uh, I think it was spring of 2001 at the Barnard like end of year party. Uh, when I asked Kathy to be my advisor, and uh, she was saying that the uh, blackness book, blackness book is basically done. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember what stage it actually was in 2001, but it came out in 2006, right? Yeah. Uh, and and then so so it took her five more years, took me uh, 15 more years from that. Point. Uh, and just one more little thing on the probably the most bizarre moment of Kathy's advising, which probably is also characteristic, was um, it start the project started with me looking at how. Um, um, <clears throat> the teaching of literature in, in Soviet schools changed during the after the Jubilee as a result of the Jubilee. She's like, oh, well, you got to interview people. You know, you always got to interview people, um, and you know, ask them what ha what happened uh, when they, um, you know, uh, were learning about Pushkin in school. And of course, you have to interview famous people. <clears throat> and uh, Dmitry Prigov happened to be staying in her apartment at the time. Uh, and I was, you know, I was in my first year of graduate school. You know, I knew Prigov was a poet, but that was basically it. Uh, and here I am, I put a little microphone on his lapel, and I'm asking him all these questions like how, you know, what did they teach you in school about Pushkin? And he increasingly got more and more frustrated with like what, you know, why, you know, and he, at the, by the end he just started reciting his Pushkin poems. <laughs> <laughs> like, Don't you know that I, this is like one, that's something I read about? Anyway, um, so yeah. So anyway, so basically what, uh, this is from a chapter that's on, um, uh, different kinds of historical fictions uh, produced for the Jubilee about Pushkin and uh, in di in different kinds of media uh, and kind of the struggle and the difficulties involved in producing you know socialist realist uh, historical fictions uh, about a pre-revolutionary theme so basically you know the uh, traditional trajectory through the Leninist dialectic of spontaneity and consciousness is really hard to uh, realize when you don't have the horizon of the revolution there um, uh, as, you know, to, to provide the trajectory. Um, so, and you, Pushkin kind of uh, stands on both sides of the dialectic. He sometimes seems to be journeying towards consciousness from some kind of elemental spontaneity. Um, but, you know, he's always left unconsummated because we, you know, we don't have uh, that moment of, you, he can't, you just cannot become conscious before the party 
uh, is around to help you. Uh, otherwise, because of course that he's being positioned as this kind of pedagogical master, you know, he's a uh, symbol for the you know amazing uh, literacy drives and so on, and the education of, of the Soviet people. Uh, he's also put in a, in this position of the the kind of vanishing mentor uh, figure that's more common as the sort of hero of um, optimistic tragedy, uh, socialist tragedy. Uh, where you know you you bring the, the mentor brings the people to consciousness and then dies tragically to sort of release them uh, to take over, um, but this uh, also doesn't work because there are no people yet to educate. Uh, the people are are basically just are still serfs, and uh, you know the, it's Pushkin is never going to be enough to get them uh, to the next stage. So instead, he ends up kind of suspended in this gap in between. Uh, and what I kind of try to look at is how this, this weird, ambivalent position uh, makes him end up being, you know, he turns kind of queer, his racial, uh, you know, racial ambiguity is, is always being emphasized. He, get, he ends up becoming, becoming kind of half man, half beast, sometimes between life and death. Uh, so to start with uh, the first of the uh, two films, the one that's more well known, The Youth, Youth of the Poet, Yunus Paeta, you can already see this. Uh, uh, animalistic uh, image. There's a, there's a, a number of, um, of shots in the film where Pushkin is like rushing through bushes or emerging startled into some clearing, uh, like some kind of jungle cat. Uh, and just to uh, and and this is a this is a really common thing. I just want to read a couple other little quotes from some other works that um, are, are similar. So this one's from. Uh, Ivan Novikov's book, Pushkin and Mikhailovskaya, he's describing how Pushkin behaved in Odessa. And he says, sometimes he would uh, jump from stone to stone across the water and bending over, make a splash into the sunlight, where he would run off and hide behind a bush and then jump out like some kind of jaguar, rolling his eyes back white. Uh, so, okay, so this is a common, a common kind of uh, way of treating the poet and, and youth of the poet um, exploits it uh, quite thoroughly. Uh, how do I do this? Now, the sort of the logic of the film is thoroughly socialist realist, and that he has this task of sort of taming his his animal passions, uh, you know, turning into the the great writer that his you know that is his destiny, uh, harmonizing life, you know, sort of raw life and form, and so this is a nice uh, way in which they uh, provide that uh, you know a kind of visual representation of that, where Pushkin assumes the same pose as uh, the famous uh, girl with. Broken pitcher in uh, in Sarska Silo, uh, which of course you know as we know with the, the tension between the uh, uh, the rushing water and the and the uh, uh, sculpture produces this kind of synthesis of, of motion and fixity that Pushkin wrote about in his own poem on, about the statue. Uh, but there uh, is you know it never works out. Um, in this case, uh, you know as I said before, it's because there are no real mentors for the uh, for the poet or the other. <laughs> Uh, you know, future Decemberists in the Lyceum. Uh, in the film, it's interesting, they originally, apparently, there were some scenes uh, featuring Chedayev and Kunitsin, the, the uh, uh, jurisprudence teacher at the Lyceum, who was quite, quite liberal, uh, but it seems like for some reason they cut those parts out, and it's not clear why. Um, but it basically leaves these young guys as like this kind of orphaned collective who are, you know, want to do something but don't really know how. A lot of the film is about how Pushkin is in love with this, the peasant uh, uh, girl Natasha, and, uh, but he can't do anything in the end of the movie. She gets sold, and she says, if you were rich, you could buy me. And he's like, uh, I can't do anything. And he goes back and says, to freedom, <laughs> to his friends. So it's very, um, it's very uh, uncertain what, what, what this is all supposed to mean. Uh, okay, so... Um, then the other film, uh, Journey to Arzurum, Putuchesvi um, Verzurum, uh, Pushkin here uh, is, is in a different kind of position. Uh, they're actually really, they work nicely together. Um, so in the, in the Youth of a Poet, Pushkin's you know, makeup is very naturally done. It's, it's kind of, a, uh, they're really trying to make him look uh, um, like a real black person. Uh, whereas, whereas here, you can see he looks kind of like a drag queen. Uh, with the wig and all this weird makeup, uh, so it's much more artificial. Um, so it kind of, uh, you know, he's he's obviously not as much in that elemental uh, position as in the other film. Uh, it's also worth noting that the film is extremely homoerotic in, in other um, ways. There's this uh, you can't see it very well, but the the moment Pushkin arrives to the camp, the military camp, is marked by this this really beautiful uh, shot of uh, bathing horses. These naked soldiers taking the horses into to bathe. Um, 
Now, Pushkin's task in the film basically is to uh, <laughs> rouse uh, the spirits of the exiled Decembrists. Um, it's all it, the historical accuracy of the film is not uh, is not there at all, but uh, <laughs> as you can imagine. But so he's he's supposed to like cheer them up. They're all depressed, uh, and one of the things he tries to do is get um, the. Sympath the December sympathizer, uh, General Orayevsky, uh, to bring all the guys together in an illegal meeting because you're not supposed to have, um, you know, officers fraternizing with soldiers, and, and uh, the Decembrists have been reduced in the ranks. Uh, and so this is from the, the uh, scene where he tries to convince Orayevsky. It's this very Orayevsky is like lying. Uh, reclined, he's got this extremely long pipe that sort of hangs limply <laughs> at his side, and Pushkin comes up and starts vigorously tickling it, uh, saying, uh, you know, let's, let's, have them, let's get the guys together. Uh, and you know, they zoom in on his face, and you have uh, Rayevsky's white, very white hand on his shoulder, and it's this very kind of, you know, uh, uncertain, uh, ambivalent kind of, what, like, what is this? Is this a human being? Is this, a, you know, is this a man? Uh, what is going on here with Pushkin? Pushkin is very, is, is extremely, uh, distinctively marked out from the other people uh, around him. Uh, then, when they finally have the meeting, it's interesting as well. Uh, the um, it kind of, they're all kind of sitting around, clutching one another, sort of uh, reminiscing about their time in prison and exile, uh, and. Um, uh, Pushkin, in the end, they start singing uh, the, uh, the romance of, of Talisman, right, this Pushkin poem. Uh, and the, um, the, uh, it's, it becomes clear that, that Pushkin is being uh, associated with the, with the Talisman, right? The Talisman is supposed to protect us uh, from, uh, from what? And so the, if you remember the last lines of, of the poem, uh, I have it translated in English here. Dear friend, from crime, from new wounds of the heart, from betrayal, from forgetting, my talisman will protect you. Right. So it's the idea is that the beloved gives um, gives the the speaker of the poem this uh, this talisman, and then she she's telling him how it's going to protect him. And so, so what you get from this, it's interesting, is that protecting the you know, Pushkin protects the Decembers from betrayal. Right. From from forgetting. Uh, that ultimately what he's doing is he's not trying to restore their kind of revolutionary potency, but kind of make them accept, uh, you know, I don't know, you could, is Emma still here? The site of castration. Uh, <laughs> the, the sort of the failure of the revolutionary event, right? To, to remain faithful uh, to that failure uh, and not sort of just, just languish, uh, but to sort of, you know, preserve it as, their, as the sort of source of their subjectivity. Um, so... Uh, Almost two. Yeah. So okay. So finally, uh, the um, two the two Decembers who've been reduced in the ranks are sent on this kind of suicide mission, um, with the promise of being restored in the ranks if they're successful. But the guys who send them on it are kind of they want them to be dead, and it's you know it's very perfidious and so on. Uh, and Pushkin is there when one of them dies, and he's he's got this goat fur cape that he wears in all of the uh, exterior shots. Again, you know this animalistic. Uh, image and when he when the, his friend dies he he does this kind of uh, uh, you know makeshift burial uh, moment and he's also you can see that he's also partially under the the goat skin and so on and this is again kind of um, you know what the focus is really in in, in all of these representations of Pushkin uh, that this is we're in this kind of putrescent time space right where there is no revolutionary horizon that is there for us uh, to to sort of realize this this trajectory that these socialist realist films are supposed to be uh, following instead we have to just anticipate this people to come uh, we have to remain and sort of you know endure within this uh, this strange ambivalent uh, position so I guess I'll stop there I'll have more time I have one minute. I, 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 I surrender my minute to the uh, <laughs> next speaker. <laughs> Do I get your minute? You can have my minute. <laughs> <laughs> I win again. <laughs> Our final paper is by Christopher Harwood, Sinyavsky's Good Night. Okay, uh, if you looked at all at the, the bio sketches in the back, uh, you'll see that I have, am now in my 15th year of exile from my former home in the study of Soviet, post-Soviet, and emigre culture. Uh, so hopefully you'll forgive me if uh, I'm a little out of practice at this. 
Uh, you might have also noticed that I laid claim to being perhaps the only uh, person who ever had Kathy as a, a teacher for an undergraduate survey course, uh, a graduate seminar, a member of my dissertation committee, and uh, a student in my intermediate and advanced language classes. <laughs> and I, I hope everyone realizes this is not boastful. This is not uh, trying to say that there was anything exceptional about the narrative of my life in Slavic studies, but really to show how truly remarkable Kathy's was. How many tenured professors, or better yet, how many outstanding contribution to the profession corner office directors of prestigious academic institutes do you know who would have the cojones to take a seat in a language class taught by a former student with undergraduates and a current Slavic department graduate student as classmates? Kathy did. Uh, and I think this is emblematic of the rare gifts she had of intellectual curiosity, courage, and a really radically democratic spirit. Uh, just as Kathy would not hesitate to engage in Andrei Sinyavsky, a Mikhail Gorbachev, or a Václav Havel uh, in direct dialogue, in their own language, of course, uh, she did not hesitate to engage her own students, graduate and undergraduate, present and past, as intellectual equals. I'm sure that uh, among Kathy's former students here today, I'm not alone, and being especially grateful to her for having invited me at a very early stage of my apprenticeship to take a seat at the grown-ups table uh, and for making me feel welcome there and almost comfortable. <laughs> so my presentation today is occasioned by Liza Knapp's discovery in Kathy's files of a term paper <laughs> uh, that I submitted in the fall of 1991 in partial completion of the requirements for Kathy's graduate seminar on Solzhenitsyn and Sinyavsky. So last September, when Liza invited all of us to participate in this event, I decided that the logical choice for me would be to present here a revisiting of that seminar paper, which I had written on Andrei Sinyavsky's 1984 autobiographical novel, Good Night, Spokojne Nochi, almost a quarter of a century ago. Uh, that paper focused on the figure of S, uh, sometimes also identified as Seryozha, who plays a critical role in the fifth and final part of the novel. Behind S stands the real-life person, Sergei Grigorievich Khmelnytsky, a childhood friend of Sinyavsky's who in young adulthood became a kind of guru for him, acquainting him for the first time with many masterpieces of modern art and literature. Sinyavsky also characterizes him as a poet of genius and as the champion of an aestheticism altogether out of season in the time of high Stalinism. Unfortunately, Khmelnytsky is also, uh, also became a notorious collaborator with the Soviet secret police. In 1949, he fabricated denunci denunciations that landed his student friends Vladimir Kabo and Yuri Bregel in the Gulag for several years. And then in 1966, he testified against Sinyavsky's co-defendant, Yuli Daniel, at the two dissident writers' famous trial. In Good Night, Sinyavsky focuses on his youthful admiration for S and on S's involvement in a plot the MGB hatched in 1948 to have Sinyavsky lure his university classmate, Alain Pelletier, the daughter of the French naval uh, attache, into a romantic relationship that could then be used to compromise the French mission. S's characterization in the novel hangs on an apparent paradox. He is portrayed as, an, as a consummate artist with unerring taste and style, a real aristocrat of the spirit, but also as a bully and a coward. A crucial moment in this characterization is S's prank at a student party, where he impulsively announces that he will kiss his classmate Irina, Irina but then he trips and winds up not so much kissing her as biting her lip and drawing blood. All the students present react to this botched stunt uh, with shock and revulsion. But Sinyaski Tirz's narrator defends the exploit saying, quote, oh, he was, if you will, attempting to perform a dazzling vaudeville for you fools, a jolly harlequinade whose theme was the turning of humdrum prose into poetry, a trivial kiss into a witty trick. I'm embarrassed now to realize uh, that in my rather tortured analysis in that paper 24 years ago, uh, it was built around a misreading of this episode. <laughs> Whereas apparently then I believed that the narrator was still trying uh, in that quoted passage to redeem S in the eyes of the readers, it seems pretty obvious to me now that even though S is referred to in the third person, this is really a case of a kind of extended uh, free and direct discourse in which the narrator is arguing S's point of view for him in what are or would be essentially S's own words. Needless to say, Kathy's comments in the margins of my paper questioning that interpretive blunder were very gentle and diplomatic. 
uh, as Kathy's own reading of Goodnight in her 1995 monograph, Abram Tertz and the Poetics of Crime, makes clear, S's transformation of life into art in this way is an essentially Stalinist technique and an ethical transgression that relegates him, in the view of Sinyavsky Tertz, to the ranks of the amoral human anomalies he calls shells, that is, people without souls. Olga Matic, in her 1989 article, Spokojne Nochi, Andrei Sinyavsky's Rebirth as Abram Tietz, was among the first commentators to assert in print that S is, quote, Stalin's life-size counterpart in the autobiographical plot of chapter five, unquote. My 1991 paper argued further that S can in fact be seen as a linking point, both morally and artistically, between the seemingly polar figures of Stalin and Sinyavsky himself. This may be one reason the narrator persistently identifies the enigmatic figure of Seryozha simply as S, since the repetition of this shared initial reinforces the comparison of features and functions he shares with Stalin and Sinyavsky respectively. Significantly, each of the three S characters has a prominent confession scene in the novel. Seryozha in chapter five, when he theatrically confesses to Sinyavsky that he has murdered two people, in fact, presumably referring to those uh, denunciations. Sinyavsky also in chapter five, when he confesses to Helen his complicity in the secret police plot to entrap her. And Stalin in chapter four, when he appears in a dream to the psychic Ala, Sinyavsky's actress friend, and begs her forgiveness for all of his sins. Well, one clearly cannot draw an equal sign between any two of these S characters. The novel emphasizes that all three are sinners, and its structure encourages us to consider analogies and key differences between their roles as artists. Besides being like Stalin in his misguided penchant for translating art into reality, metaphor into deed, Seryozha also represents a hypothetical alternative path for Sinyavsky, that of the artist intellectual who actively collaborates with Stalinist intrigue and terror. Rereading Goodnight in 2016, I liked the novel much better than I did in 1991. I believe I understood it much better the second time, appreciating the plight of its dissident turned exile author hero on a human level that I was perhaps not experientially capable of as a 22 year old. In my second reading, I was particularly struck too by how many ways it reminded me of a literary work of very different provenance. I observed. Here is a first person narrative that tells how the narrator protagonist becomes a writer. The protagonist goes into exile in France and the book itself was written uh, in France by a non-French writer. The narrative devotes a great deal of attention to ghosts and to the ways that living, the living perceive them and possibly communicate with them. The protagonist has a formative but complicated relationship with his strict father who was born into the nobility. The protagonist is fascinated by the art of the tapestry and devotes extended passages to its description. The protagonist adores books, practically making a fetish of them. One of the books he recalls most fondly and specifically is a bibliographic rarity, an account of the history of the false Dimitri. The figure of the false Dimitri, and more generally the problem of imposture, uh, resonate with the novel's other explorations of the problem of human identity, in particular with the protagonist's complex, fragmented, and at times unstable sense of his own identity. One might think uh, that all of these terms could hardly apply with equal validity to two literary works written in different languages and nearly three quarters of a century apart from each other. And yet, they accurately describe key elements both of Goodnight by Sinyavsky Tertz and the Notebooks of Malta Lourdes Brigge by Raina Maria Rilke, which I read for the first time a few months after reading Goodnight, and which I've since had the occasion to teach five or six times. <laughs> uh, is it possible that Sinyavsky had read the prose masterpiece of one of the German language's great uh, 20th century poets? In the words of Brigge, yes, it is possible. Uh, a Russian translation of Brigge was published in 1913, and we know that Sinyavsky had access to many bibliographic rarities in the Lenin Library. We also know that Sinyavsky was an avid, avid student of Pasternak and that he wrote the long introduction to the 1965 Bibliotheca Poeta edition of Pasternak's poetry. Pasternak, in turn, was an avid student and sometime correspondent of Rilke's. He admired the notebooks of Malta Lorid's Brigge, particularly citing it in correspondence as an influence on his own lyrical novel, Dr. Zhivago. I don't want to overstate the parallels between Goodnight and Brigge, of course. Uh, and a major in, uh, motivation for Sinyavsky in exploring the identity of the false Dimitri is to consider the imposter's resemblance to Stalin and to Stalin's potential successors. Indeed, the entire novel can be read as an account of Sinyavsky's confrontation with and flight from the phenomenon of Stalinism, 
which never could have been a, pr a concern for uh, Rilke or for Poor Brigge. Nonetheless, I find striking the shared preoccupation that both of these texts have with the art and political history of the early modern period, with ghosts, with problems of identity, and with a high aestheticist sense of artistic value. In the previously cited article, Olga Matic suggests that Good Night could be read against the, uh, quote, should be read against the background of Russian symbolism and the avant-garde. The novel's cultural mythology and ideas about the nature of art go back to the Silver Age, whereas its provocative style and imagery are in the tradition of Babel and Mayakovsky, as if a shockingly crude revolutionary aesthetic had been grafted onto the refined idealist culture of the mystical turn of the century. While Matic's reading uh, connects Good Night to some specifically Russian Orthodox iconography and to mystical tropes of Russian symbolism, I believe that one can attribute some of the novel's aesthetics and some of the ambiance of its Kunstler-Roman uh, narrative to at least one non-Russian modernist source. The final acknowledgement to Kathy I'd like to make in connection with my reading and rereading of Good Night is the role she played in expanding my view of literature. I could not have re-examined this text the way I have now if Kathy had not encouraged me by the example of her own scholarship and argumentation to consider more about a text than just what is most narrowly in the text itself. On the one hand, she helped reawaken in me an interest in the lives of writers and the societies they live in, an interest that I had lost track of at some point in my youthful attempts to fashion myself as a neo-formalist literary scholar. On the other hand, I believe I also to Kathy my finally grasping the most basic and I think unassailable principle of post-structuralist theory, that meaning is not inherent in the te text itself, but emerges in the interaction of the reader with the text. Kathy articulates this idea and its relevance for understanding the work of Sinyavsky Terz very clearly and persuasively at the end of the first chapter of Abraham Terz and the Poetics of Crime. It gave me a thrill to read that theoretical explication this past winter and to think about the many ways that my classes and conversations with Kathy over the years had prepared me to understand that premise as something almost self-evident and necessary. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, all of you have further advanced my education. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and we have time for questions from the floor and discussions. Ellen Chances, Princeton University. For Jonathan, just uh, what you were describing of Pushkin at the mm -hmm. very beginning mm -hmm. is so much like Harms, uh, mm -hmm. as if it's one of the anecdotes about Pushkin. I'm not claiming that there's a connection mm -hmm. at all, but it's just <laughs> striking. Mm -hmm. Just how um, spot on he was. Mm -hmm. you, you want to answer that? Oh, should I say something? Yeah, Harms, well, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, space forever. Um, well, I mean, Harms's Pushkin, I mean, you're talking about Harms's Pushkin, but yeah, I mean, well, those, it's written at the same time, so I don't think it's accidental. Uh, and, you know, Harms was also, um, he actually was trying to write something that would be published uh, during the Jubilee, a, ch a children's text. Um, and a lot of the, uh, and like he couldn't get it to work properly, but he, there are moments in it that he takes into his, his more um, avant garde. Um, and funny <laughs> texts about Pushkin. So, so yeah, I don't think it's. I mean, everyone is. Uh, Pushkin is always uh, during in this period in in uh, in being represented. Whenever you try to depict him in some kind of narrative way, he always ends up in this very strange, slippery uh, position. Which is, you know, in and in, in all, throughout Russian culture, I think you find a lot of uh, that with Pushkin. So. Uh, I was going to ask about. Uh, I'd like to ask something about Nijinsky. How well or how deeply read do you think he was in, Rus in, in the Russian classics? We know from his sister he didn't write too much because until this final effusion. Um, she writing. does say, though, in her memoirs, I mean, that you know, yes, I know, but that he read a lot. So well, was, she yeah. says that he read a lot, but you know, when you actually look at all that he was doing from, on a day to day basis, not at yeah. that moment, but certainly earlier one wonders. But I wondered whether in the writing you found, apart from this one poem, you found many other echoes 
Well, the biggest one is Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. And so I have an article coming out in December in the, um, mm -hmm. a volume of essays on the mobility on that. And um, that one is de definite. He really, but he was reading the late works of Tolstoy. Yes. So he was a Tolstoyan. And he, so there you see Confession, Ispavid, you see especially this Nakaj Didian, which was this compilation of um, um, words of wisdom, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it, that, that, that Tolstoy put together, his own words of wisdom and like famous people. And he, he quotes that. Mm -hmm. so, so Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, he mentions, he's I'm sure aware that a lot of the characters in Dostoevsky ended up in insane asylums in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a couple in like demons, and then of course the idiot who he says he's the idiot. Mm -hmm. um, then um, Gogol, to a certain extent, I think that um, there's also the connection. This is not with the Russians, but with um, Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. He, he um, you see him sort of struggling with the idea. I don't know how. I don't know how much he really. Read Nietzsche. His wife said he did, and but the idea was that Nietzsche went mad in the same place, and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then I see an affinity. I don't think he he doesn't mention this, but um, there's a real affinity with Zaum, the um, mm -hmm. futurist poetry. Mm -hmm. I mean, even his his words. I tried to hint at that at the yes. end, the um and razum. So he makes a distinction. Razum is knowledge felt through the body. Mm -hmm. And um is knowledge divorced from the body as in the mind-body dualism. Mm -hmm. Whereas he says, you know, I, I'm summa shed she's razum. Yes. And everything, every single page, he's like, he never, he's very consistent and that can't be translated in the English translation. You're like, he's just being inconsistent, mind, intellect, you know. Mm -hmm. But he means it very specifically, and I don't know, he says that he gets this from Tolstoy, like, he, or not that distinction, but he says he gets, you know, he knows that Tolstoy wrote a lot about uh, Razum, Schopenhauer wrote a lot about Razum, and he says he's the philo philosopher. He is Razum philosophy. But I, I wonder with the Pushkin poem, the way that those two words are set up like that, that even though they're in verse, Pushkin says, um, I hope I don't go out of my um, but mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't value razum. But uh, and mm -hmm. he kind of reverses those almost, almost literally. It is like he's playing with words, like like these are like, like they're new. There's something about the way he plays with the words is similar to zaum, but also, right. you know, it's that fine line. Like, is he really just like as if this is all new, you know? Too. Right. So to and get back to your question, yeah, no, I yes, think there is some. Breath, but you know, yeah, he was a dancer that was spending, as you said, all his time on, on dance. But he claims that he would go into his room and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. read, and he wanted to be mm -hmm. a writer from like an adolescent. Anyway. <laughs> well, Thank you. Please, uh, please, please, please. So I'm a dance critic, and, I, and, and I'm asking the question on two fronts. Uh, is um, my friends Ellen Day and Carl Proffer sent me the Xeroxed copy, every single page of the Nijinsky diary in Russian when it first became available through Igor Markevich, um, who had married Kira, the first daughter. Um, so I read every single page in Russian, and um, the Proffers decided not to publish it. Mm -hmm and then went on the market about 15 years later. Um, it, there was a British agent, um, Glass, who was originally asked to sell it. Um, I think also I helped edit Bronislava Nizhinska's memoirs, uh, which were, she died, they were being edited by her daughter, Irina, whom I knew quite well, and unfortunately, uh, Irina spent too much time restaging Bronislava's uh, 
ballets and, um, and her mother's ballets, I mean, Bratislava, so she never got past 1914, but it was a very detailed account, and I know Lynn, you questioned some of it there. Yeah. But um, the thing is, um, I think you have to realize the state he was in when he wrote that diary, and, that she, and I want to ask you whether you believe, as he says in it, that he had sex with cats. And he doesn't say that. Yes, he does in the original. That's why you, that, this I, is my I hope. looked at the original at You the did time. not see the I, original. The, That's the point. The one I looked at is at the New York Public Library. In the Russian script, handwritten? Yeah, it's on microfilm. You can, anybody. Well, it, I'm sorry, it was in there. And also that Jagdlov's doctor had a heart attack because he was so sexually aroused by Tamara Kersavina. I'm just saying I have seen that diary in many versions. He does mention sex with cats, but not him having sex with cats. Just I think so. I think. Okay. Uh, I think there's. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't, frankly, I don't think any of us care whether he had sex with cats. But the point is, how? I actually, I actually have a theory I'm on, just on that. That I don't know. Uh, what we today can believe or not believe about somebody who was writing at that time in a disturbed state of that kind and perhaps misdiagnosed, that's all, it's a comment. So I feel that you do believe everything that's written in that diary? I, I, my, um, I'm not trying to say is it what he's writing is true or not. I'm, I'm looking at it, what he's doing with language. So it's not a question of, Correct. Uh, no, I'm, not, I, I'm just saying what he's doing with language is, the way I describe it, it's kind of like, it is disturbingly on that border between art and life. Okay, that's And I mean, that's, and I kind of see it like performance art of like the late, like 60s and 70s where he's, I mean, it's like body art, like he's doing this thing. I mean, yes, it's, on the one hand it is, life and it's it's sad and all these you know it's um it's disturbing too and but on the other hand it's he's a perf he's it's like performance i mean he's aware of this as performing so i see it as kind of in between okay, well, and, and mostly i think where you're coming from i yeah. accept that but i just don't accept it from a traditional way of an, an analysis so you brought in something new um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, uh, <laughs> Hold that thought. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you for the lovely presentation. Um, it, it was interesting to look at Pushkin right through the two different glances, one through the, the lens of a savage, or, mm -hmm. and the other is this homoeroticized um, uh, man, and uh, that that kind of uh, interests me in a sense that Google, right, his counterpart, frequent, they are frequently mentioned, right, together. It's also he he is also homo eroticized, right. He, he also has this aspect to, uh, I guess, his image. And if you can just comment on that, why these two? Uh, what does Homo eroticism has to do, I mean, have to do, right, with the perception of, of these two um, literary giants, right, who cannot really be placed in any position. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess, I mean, that's my. Um, well, I mean, with Gogol, it's in the works themselves, right? So, uh, although, I don't know, I mean, for me, the, whenever I think of Gogol, I think of, uh, he's kind of like Morrissey, you know, he's like. Uh, <laughs> permanently celibate, uh, but probably should have just gone for it. But he, um, he did not write as many songs. <laughs> he wrote some good texts, almost as good as Morrissey's songs. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, is, is Gogol when we like, do we have uh, like films about Gogol that, um, you know, uh, represent him in, in homoerotic ways? Or I, I'm just not aware of, of that as much. I mean, I know, you know, obviously there's, you know, the, uh, the texts themselves that have all this um, uh, homoerotic quality to them, but uh, otherwise, I don't know. I mean, it, it, you can't. I mean, if you want to make a sort of broader parallel, I think you certainly can in terms of you know this this um, position of the 
canonical Russian writer very often, and, and maybe Pushkin and Gogol are where it would be the two most uh, characteristic examples as, you know, sort of very hard to place, right? Yeah. Uh, very difficult to uh, to define uh, in terms of identity, um, and actually, I mean, there's there's uh, Pushkin himself during in his time it would would uh, make fun of everyone, you know, for uh, like he has this um, there's this famous moment where he uh, was making fun of Adoyevsky, uh, quoting this uh, this famous statement from um, who was it the Pompidour or whatever some some 18th century French. Um, society woman, I can't remember, who says uh, and saying that sa uh, pensée n'a pas de sexe, right? So like he's <laughs> uh, so, with, and it comes from the the, uh, the original saying is like a feminist statement that thought does not have gender, right? So women can think as much as men, but when you say it about Adoyevsky, it means that there's no sex in his in his thinking. It's not sexy and it's uh, lacking masculinity, right? Um, but you know, then Pushkin himself would often get you know mocked uh, in one way or another, or even even a friendly, I mean, I feel like this stuff is kind of friendly, I don't know what you guys would say, but like, you know, but you'll find in like 19th century memoir, memoirs about meeting Pushkin, you know, and he would smile with those big white teeth of his and, you know, this kind of stuff, but, it, but and it's not meant to be uh, something negative, it's just sort of the characteristic of, of him, but um, I don't know. I'm wondering though how much of that, I mean, yeah. Kathy and Nicole mm -hmm. and I, you know, worked on the whole racial aspect yeah. of it, and I mean, there were definite aspects of that sense of the African yeah. and the Africanness of Pushkin, right. and that's tied into a complex of associations, right. which are, when you use them, in different contexts, they're not charged. Right. right. Well, I mean, that's they the thing. You know, his Lyceum nickname charged. is Monkey, right. and in in Youth of a Poet, there's you know, it's interesting. There's this moment when he's fighting with one of the other uh, kids, and the kid is like, "Monkey, don't you know, don't uh, do this." And th but then when he like rats him out afterwards, like Pushkin, you know, he's crazy. You know, he's he, this this Diki Afrikanets. Uh, you know, he attacked me like a panther. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's like there's this kind of weird. Um, like you can f call him this kind of friendly racism, uh, you can call him monkey that he accepts or whatever. Um, and well, it's bestialization of someone who looks different from you, so I think right. you can call it racism. Uh, or, or you know, uh, it becomes this really kind of uh, genuine, you know, that there's something, something dangerous in this guy, something too raw and untamed uh, for, for our civilization. And then the Soviets in the film version are sort of celebrating that, that this, is, this shows that he has a kind of, I don't know, like Pavka Karchagin quality of like, of like intensity that could be used for revolutionary purposes, but they can't, I mean, my point is that they can't take it to any kind of logical conclusion uh, just because the historical situation doesn't allow that. Use a microphone. Yeah, I just wonder when does homoeroticism enter the picture, right? But kind of, uh, it becomes added to this, you know, very concrete image of the savage or some mm -hmm. association with blackness because this is, just to me, it was very new. Mm -hmm. um, when? I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, it's the director's choice in many ways. You know, I think it's. Did you a, see earlier examples? Of it, it's, uh, it's not something that I've seen much of, actually, yeah. to be honest. Like, this was a very uh, specific example uh, where in this story, I and, mean, you know, it has to do with the male collective of the Decembrists in exile. Um, you know, it has to do with, uh, there's also moments like the, the bad guys in the film are all extremely lascivious, like there's this moment where they're uh, sitting around the dinner table with Pushkin work from that one picture, uh, eat, you know, chomping on meat and, and they, they uh, recite their favorite line from Pushkin, which is a description of, of Ludmilla and Ruslan Ludmilla being scantily dressed, basically, and like we want you to write more things like that. Uh, so like sexuality itself is kind of, it's not about, it's not necessarily about sexuality, but it's about this kind of, uh, the, the homoeroticism is more about, um, you know, this warming of each other in the, you know, in the space of, of defeat, right, in order to, to hold on to that. Um, I'm, I'm but, sorry, mm -hmm. I actually wonder if that, mm -hmm. se sorry, the sense of homoeroticism yeah. is coming up because what they're trying to do is make the nobility mm -hmm. and representatives of the empire mm -hmm. appear to be less human, right? And, le you know, it, it, you know oh. so is it, that, is it that they're becoming more animalistic? Mm -hmm. 
because they're not on the right side. Well, that I mean, that is the problem. Right but they they are on the right side. I mean, it's like you know, Pamiti uh, Gertsina, right? I mean, do they right, do they ever right, put right. up on the monument like Strashna uh, Daliki at Naroda? I mean, do you get that as the? As right, right. No, they don't. Uh, <laughs> but so the, it's like they're it's all extremely right, positive. Right. We love these guys, right. but no, 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 they are not but I'm talking human about yet. The, right, no, the, but the imperial <laughs> yeah. authorities, not the Decemberists themselves. Ah, but the, the imperial authorities are extremely the hetero normatively marked. Uh, the imperial in that movie at least they're they're lascivious and uh, you know uh, interested in, in girls but uh, whereas yeah. the, the guys stick together on, in the December scrap camp but, uh, well it's been I a long time since I've seen yeah, it, so I, I, don't I think uh, <laughs> I think we're coming to an end now uh, it's uh, three o'clock uh, is there one final question anyone has no okay well thank you for a terrific panel <laughs> <laughs>